It's really cool to be, be doing this and uh, talk a little bit more about tithing and, and uh, I guess the, the bigger picture of what tithing is really about. Um, I guess that also means the, the financial side of things. Just at the moment, uh, our son uh, is, our oldest son is, is four and a half and we're starting to try and teach him about finances, so, you know, getting pocket money and things like that. And I don't know if you remember, but Matt McGrath did a tithe talk a while ago. He talked about that. He introduced a book called Smart Money, Smart Kids uh, by a Christian author, uh, Dave Ramsey. And he t- turns out he has a, uh, a great methodology uh, around this, and we ended up buying uh, one of his... Um, packages. It's called Financial Peace Junior. It's basically like a little kit that you, takes you through activities to help you introduce uh, you know, money concepts to your children um, between 3 and 12. Uh, it had a whole bunch of great content in there. Now, I don't know how much you know about Dave Ramsey, but he's a, uh, even though he's a businessman, he sounds more like a preacher when you hear him talk. He's just full of the word. It's an incredible uh, listening to him. Um, and he believes very much in work. The first section, the first part of this course is about work. And he tells this really funny joke that I thought I'd share with you as our, as our opener. So uh, he's a, a, a preacher man, comes up over a hill, and he sees this immaculate, stunning farm. And as he gets closer to the farm, he can see that the, each row of the crops are in complete and perfect order. There's not a weed on the farm. And he, he sees the, the farmer. So he walks up to the farmer and he says, uh, God has blessed you with this amazing farm. And the farmer is standing there. He's ragged and, you know, he's got dirt all over his clothes. He's got calluses on his hands and his skin is, you know, leathery from, from the, the beating sun. He turns back to the preacher. He says, yes, sir, God, God has, uh, has definitely blessed me with, with, with a lot. And I get on my knees every day and I thank him very much for, for all that he's blessed me with. But you should have seen this place when he gave it to me. <laughs> You know, uh, it's kind of funny how, um, you know, you can hear, sometimes you hear people say, you know, you, you've been really blessed with, with what you've got. Or, uh, you know, you're really lucky. People say, you know, that's probably a more even uh, common coin term. Uh, and they don't see the, the work or the process that would take you to get to that place. Uh, but, you know, there's also sometimes people can look at, at you and say you're lucky or you're blessed. And it may not always come from the right place either. Like it could be envious or it could be jealousy. Uh, you don't know that when you hear it, but you know, there's always that, that sort of, there's, there's, a, there's a, a thing you say and there's a, an intent behind that. Uh, and you know, today I wanted to you know, kind of look at, uh, you know, I guess a little bit, uh, a bit more about that. You know, is that the right, you know, uh, cult, the, not the right culture, but the right, uh, way that you, you look at, at things in the world. Like when you look at, at what around you, what God has given you and what God has given other people, is that you know, the, the, the right sort of mentality? Um, you know, when I was a, uh, uh, a youth, so in, uh, in church, I went to, uh, I grew up in Paidor, but for my, uh, at least one of my high school years, I went to um, Hamilton Fraser High School, and I joined a church there called the Eastside Apostolic Church. And uh, there I got into the, the youth uh, team. Even though I was in high school, I was actually a part of the university group and played in the um, worship bands there and you know, wanted to be on fire for God, whatever that meant. You know, nobody, nobody had, you know, no one was a Burns victim or anything like that, so there was no literal, uh, I gathered, uh, there was no literal aspect to being on fire for God, but, um, you know, I, I wanted to absorb that environment and be, uh, and be on fire for God. Uh, and what I had kind of gathered from that was, it left me somewhat frustrated or um, at, at ends with myself, because the, the kind of messaging that I received was this idea of being, you know, giving up yourself, picking up your cross and carrying it daily. Not that these are you know, unbiblical things, um, but that you always had to sort of give of yourself and never really talked much about how that returns to you or how you, you get built up from 
all of this, this giving and sacrifice. And sometimes it kind of was illustrated like, you know, you had to go and serve in the, in, you know, in the, in the mission field in the most poorest of countries and wear rags and, and you know, like, you know, <laughs> it, it, was, it was never like this sort of glorious thing. It was like, it didn't make sense to me. Like, how is it that God wants you to, to basically do that, right? And, and I, it, I just didn't get it. So it wasn't really until I came to this church, the VCC, where a whole new teaching started to make things connect for me, where God you know, wanted to have prosperity inside your life and not poverty, and that this was the design of God, not the opposite direction. Uh, and that was really powerful. Now, uh, I'm a, you know, a, a very analytical person. You know about those um, animals they say uh, they, they use to sort of st- uh, stereotype your character? There's sort of four of them. I can only think of three. There's the owl, who's analytical. That's me. There's the lion. That's the, the, the leader or the person who sort of leads with a gut feel. There's the monkey. There's the, uh, is the socialite. They often make cracks jokes and, and uh, is always want to hang out. And I can't remember what the fourth one was. A beaver. A beaver. Okay. <laughs> Golden retriever. Golden retriever. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I can't remember. It was the beaver. Is a hard worker or is it? Or? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm the owl. I'm the, I'm the analytical person, and I often can't do anything. I can't really get involved in doing something until I understand how it works. And then I also become like an authority on that as well. Uh, if I can't do it, then I don't make the decision, and that's called uh, paralysis from analysis. <laughs> where, and and it's, a, it's a real thing. I'm like, I want to go do something, but I just don't know I'll, I'll be successful with it. And I don't have the, that sort of gut like the lion would to be able to just go, oh, we'll just go and do it. Uh, and so God leads me through my analytical mind, not through my gut mind. Right? And, uh, and so when I um, uh, heard about this idea of prosperity, uh, I wanted to understand how that works so that if I can figure it out, I'm going, you know, I, I can trigger it in my life and make sure it happens. That's what I'm going to share with you today. So, uh, when I was, uh, yeah, so just processing on this a little bit. So, how does God's will uh, for me, uh, how, what, what, how does God's will work for me and how, do I, how I prosper uh, in, in the things that I do? Uh, when I was thinking about this, you know, it came, it dawned on me that the prosperity of God can't be a supernatural thing which might sound a bit counterintuitive. But it can't be because there are people in this world who are not saved who are wealthy, right? There there is a lot of wealth in this world that's not owned by by Christians or by by Jews. So it it can't be a supernatural thing. Now, if it... But however, if it's still a part of his will, then it has to be a natural thing. So, you know... if you are, um, this is where remembering that God is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, that he's a constant, that he is always there. This is particularly important because if it's, if it's his will and it's natural and he's always there, then it means that the prosperity that he wants for you was actually formed in the beginning in creation as it goes all the way back to the very beginning. And I can help you, uh, I can help prove that to you. Uh, now, before, I, yeah, we'll, we'll just go straight through for that part. Um, all right, so prosperity is built from current and stewardship. These laws can be seen uh, directly in the fabric of creation. So uh, the rivers uh, play a natural, uh, play a role in our, in our natural ecosystem, that ecosystem, ecosystem, ecosystem. <laughs> that exhibits both these qualities, uh, and they show us how prosperity works. So these rivers are the, the model. They are the example for us to look at in God's creation and understand by looking at how they make the ecosystem work. Maybe we can understand how uh, we can make similar aspects in our, in our world uh, work as well. So um, if we have a look at Genesis uh, chapter 1, so right at the very beginning, verse 6 and verse 9. So verse 6, it says, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. Really confusing. But basically, atmosphere and sea. 
atmosphere and ocean is what that separation was about. Uh, that's important because we know that you know, eventually rain comes from the sky and down into the, into the water, and there's a cycle, uh, uh, an ecosystem that forms from that. In um, verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And so it was. So uh, here, now land comes up, and water is now moving across the land. That's the, you know, the river's formation, uh, and we now have uh, an infrastructure in place. You know, when, and we see this a lot now, there's construction, it seems, these days everywhere around us. And if you, you know, drive by, you know, there's a, a hotel being built at the moment down in the hut. You couldn't tell that it was a hotel because it doesn't look like a hotel yet, but that thing has been a construction site for over a year. And it takes a really long time to get the foundations in place. But once the foundations are in place, then you can start building things on top of them, and that, as long as the foundations are reliable, that, that structure will hold up. And this is the, exactly the same thing that, that is happening. In fact, you know, we get the idea of building buildings uh, out of what happened in creation. So you know, the very first three days, God spends laying the foundations of his creation, and he builds on top of that. So uh, the, the, uh, out of those first three days come these four rivers that are mentioned in chapter 2 uh, from Eden, the uh, Pishon, Gihon, Tigris, and Euphrates rivers. And they act as this, this underlying infrastructure that then feeds a whole bunch of vegetation and animals. And animals and vegetation and man don't come along until that infrastructure is in place. Uh, so this is uh, yeah, God showing us how his economy works with water as the currency. So water is essentially this, this symbolism of life, right? And we see that again and later when Jesus comes along and he talks about I am the, the, yeah, the fountain of life and uh, we use water baptism as well. Like this is a, a massive symbolic thing and rivers are these stewards that move that water around and from the Garden of Eden out into the rest of the world. Uh, so some of the other aspects about the rivers. So they have a directional flow, a current of water that is foundational to the economy of Eden. To parallel, money has a directional flow, which we call currency, and that is the foundation to the economy of modern society. So the river is a, a steward of water, the resource, not a keep opposed to a lake, which you might have remembered from my last tithe talk. Don't really talk about lakes in this one. Uh, and so. Yeah, rivers have this, both these two concepts of a current or a flow, a movement, and stewardship, being able to direct the resource where it needs to go. Uh, so let's take a, a closer look at current. Um, so current is a directional, persistent flow of a resource. And you know, there are lots of these different phenomena. The current is present in a lot of different phenomena across our uh, you know, existence. But here are three. So we talked about one, which is rivers. And you know, the resource for a river is water. And the, the strength of that water is measured in the volume that passes through that river in any given moment, right? So it could be you know, cubic meters per second, or you can measure it in liters per second, or, or whatever. You've got electricity, which also has the concept of current that we know of. Uh, and the resource for that is electrons, and that is measured in amplitude. So you know, the stronger the current, the higher the ampage is. Um, and then you also have a, a directional aspect of that. So there's uh, alternating current, where it, the, the current goes back and forth inside of the, the electricity, or direct current, where it just has a, a flow in a single direction. And of course, you've also, if you uh, have ever played around with, with um, say, audio speakers or, or um, I don't know, some sort of batteries or something, you might have seen like a black and a red uh, cable, you know, li neutral and, and live or um, positive and negative. And uh, they, the direction that those connect to the battery is going to dictate which direction the electri uh, electricity flows. Um, and then the third example in there is the economy, uh, is the phenomenon. The resource is money. Uh, of course, we call that currency. And the strength of that is measured in our gross domestic product, or GDP, if you've ever heard that term before. Um, and so GDP, GDP has growth. That's what every government wants for its country, is to have growth year on year or quarter on quarter. And then it also has decline, uh, where after two quarters or six months, if that decline is consistent, they call that a recession. 
And so it has both direction and strength uh, associated to it as well. You know, your life has currents too. And that doesn't have just one. You're, you know, it's not like, yeah, I'm just going to work. That's my direction and I'm taking my time. That's not the, the current I'm talking about. It is, uh, you actually have lots of different currents in your life. Uh, and they all need to have a continual directional flow in them in order for us to leverage uh, God's plan for prosperity and lives in them. So uh, those areas, there are lots of different names for them, so these aren't sort of the finite names. Uh, I know if you do some internet researching, you'll find some have you know, five names, some have six, some have seven names. Uh, it depends on how well you want to, to look at them. I uh, really just pulled together these six for, for, for the sake of this message. So uh, the six are um, mental, physical, financial, relational, knowledge, and spiritual. Now, each current has a strength in a positive or negative direction. Um, so currents have strength, and uh, you, know, you may have a current today that is weak in your life. Uh, they, your currents also have a direction, and you might have a, uh, a direction in, the, in you know, one of these six areas that perhaps is off course or uh, not in the right, right direction. But unless you look at these areas and identify that they are currents, that they are flows in your life, and you don't, if, you, if you don't look at them holistically and say, well, are they flowing in the right direction, uh, you wouldn't know. So uh, I've already mentioned, yeah, electricity has the red wire, black wire. They can go back in different directions. Economies have inward flow and outward flow. Uh, and, you know, floods, uh, sorry, water, rather, and rivers, uh, they can be, you know, they can be in flood, which is where they actually end up being destruct destructive um, because... The, the direction that the river has for them to go, it can no longer control. Or, you know, they can have a lack of water in a river, and then that actually breeds poverty because it can't feed everything that the river uh, provides for. So um, I have for you in the outlines, and if you have a pen, uh, it'll be useful, uh, a little table of six cells. And this is just, this is for you, this is not for anybody else. It's just a way for you to kind of do a little bit of a reflection and figure out if you're going in the right direction in, in these areas of your life. So you might like to write them down. I suggested a scale of from negative two to two. So negative two and negative one would be going backwards from the direction you think you should be going. One and two is you're doing really well in that direction. Uh, and you know, zero is you're not making any progress anywhere in that direction. So you know, physical is you know, are you eating well? Are you exercising? Do you look like Bevan Clark? You know? <laughs> How do you not have a girlfriend, Bevan, without looking like that? <laughs> do you know, we have a, you didn't mention this, but in July we have an all night prayer meeting coming up. <laughs> and uh, I was thinking at least an hour, right? <laughs> uh, Bevan's good. If you need his number, let me know. Uh, so mental uh, is, you know, are you, are you, um, you know, feeding your, your brain with, with knowledge or are you feeding it with healthy, uh, positive thoughts or is there, is there negativity, negativity there? You know, are you watching, you know, TV that's not good for you uh, and is that having an impact or, you know, are you not giving your mind enough rest uh, is another, another thought. Um, so financial, you know, are your finances heading in the right direction? Are you heading out of debt? And are you heading into prosperity? That one's an easy one, right? Is your bank account red or black? Uh, relational, you know, have you got the right relationships in, in your life? And are they you know, in, in a, in a, heading in a positive direction? Uh, or are some of them broken down at the moment? Um, you know, knowledge, uh, yeah, I think knowledge is one of, one of those things that helps. Well, maybe I put that in there because of my... my uh, the way that I think and, and function, but without that knowledge, I don't know how to steer any of these things, how to build them in strength and how to put them in a different direction. So I always want to know that, that I'm building on that, and I don't, don't think that would be something that I'd ever be happy with, right, in this scale that would never be a two. Uh, and then, of course, spiritual. Even though I put that last, it's almost sort of the first thing. It's like this driving seat for you. Uh, you know, so you want that, that to be as powerful as possible. Um, you know, I, uh, a couple of years ago, I um, came across a book. Well, actually, I came across a news article that turned into me buying a book. 
um, that was talking about uh, habits of self-made millionaires. So a guy, uh, the author Thomas C. Corley, he spent five years researching the daily habits of 177 self-made millionaires, and uh, he published a book that talked about the habits of these 177 that are statistically common, right? Uh, and it helped me uh, understand a couple of things. One was habits are, um, are basically stored procedures in your brain. Like there's a physical thing about a habit. It's actually physically there. And uh, it's there physically because it's cheaper for your brain to do that habit than it would be to think about doing something else or doing something that you're not used to doing. So, you know, this is why sometimes people feel like they go on holiday and they, need, they come back and they're so exhausted, they need another holiday. It's because they, you know, when, when you're at you know, work and you've got your daily commute and your daily schedule and your daily routine for going and doing something, all of that stuff is habitual. It's cheaper for your brain to do all that stuff. But when you're on holiday, you, you know, you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're staying, you don't know, you know what you're going to do today and your just, eyes are just taking in so much that's going on. You've got so much more challenging things going on in your brain. So, um, you know, you, if you get yourself into good habits, then habitually you just do good things. If you get yourself into bad habits, habitually you do bad things, and it's really easy for your body to do those things. It's really easy to break bad habits, and it's really easy to break uh, good habits. So it's a, um, this was a, a bit of a pivotal book that started me on this, this new journey. Uh, and so uh, there are... There are, um, there are a bunch of things that I took away from this book that were habits that I wanted to um, take on for myself, but there are, I guess these are, these are habits that are worth sharing and, and showing you what you know, the 177 millionaire, self-made millionaires all had in common. Uh, so those were, they, they read for self-improvement, they get up early, they are positive thinking, they pursue goals, they have mentors, they surround themselves with like-minded people, and they spend 15 to 30 minutes a day just thinking and meditating. Uh, and I thought, wow, this is really cool. Uh, you know, you, the, the, the premise of the book was get these habits in your life, and then you know, eventually you'll start to just see the fact that you're having those habits in your life improve things. It's like, okay, that's really cool. However, this was not written by a Christian. This wasn't you know, um, I don't know that this was necessarily biblical thinking. And so my ad an analytical mind, and this is sort of already going into stewardship a little bit, but I wanted to make sure that the things that I was going to do over my life were going to be biblical ones. I didn't want to sort of accept them just because they were statistically relevant in today's self-made millionaires. So I went through and found evidence that each one of these things are also biblical truths. So, uh, read for self-improvement. Well, that's the Bible, duh. Uh, get up early. That's uh, Mark 1.35, where uh, you know, Jesus was an early riser, and he went to go and pray. So, it was also him spending 13 to 15 minutes a day thinking and meditating is also uh, that, that piece as well. Uh, positive thinking, that's Philippians 4.8, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, do those things. Uh, pursue goals, per Proverbs 16:9. In the hearts, human humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Uh, have mentors, so Proverbs 1:5. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. Uh, and surround yourselves with like-minded people, for where there are two or three gathered in my name, there I am also. So this is all, you know, biblical truths that. Self-made millionaires happen to be leveraging, right? This is like still, still proof that God's plan for prosperity is actually in creation because people can leverage the stuff without being, without being a Christian. Yes. So uh, I, I ended up um, taking these and using more biblical principle over this and, and, and sort of this habitual methodology for establishing habits. Uh, so we know as Christians that if you speak life, then it's going to be, you know, then, then that will be more inclined to come. So I wrote down a series of confessions that I then decided, like, I'm going to read these every day. It doesn't matter if they are true in my life right now or not. I'm going to speak them out over myself every day, and they're going to have an impact over time. 
I'm going to share that list with you. So I, this is what I say. I try and say it every day. I don't always remember to, but uh, try and say this every day. I get up early, 5 a.m. I read for self-improvement. I eat healthy, drink water as preference, which means every time I go to make another coffee or I go and, uh, you know, go to get some... I, I haven't had a Coke or a fruit juice in a long, long time. Uh, because every time I do, I think about my confessions and say, if I drink that, then I'm not standing against my confessions. I set and track goals every week. I am the spiritual head of my family. I maintain a large social network. That doesn't mean Facebook. That just means you know I connect with people regularly and connect with, with people as, as often as I can. Uh, I am focused and productive. I'm fit and strong. I love my, li- my wife, and I will lay down my life to serve her. I love people. <laughs> I love people and believe the best in them. I wake up with glorious purpose. Christ in me is stronger than the wrong desires in me. Uh, I develop leaders. It's not something I do, it's who I am. wasn't really expecting to get emotional in this talk. It's the other positive of having an analytical mind and not an emotional one. Uh, uh, sometimes, you know, I, I move these confessions forward. I make progress on them. Sometimes they go backwards. Um, but having them in place, the sum net effect of that is that they are all... I've, I'm, I've improved since having them. Uh, and, and that means that I now know that I have a, a current in these directions, I have a strength in this direction, and it's getting better. So that kind of leads us on to uh, leadership. Is it stewardship? Is it really like seven minutes past 11? Man, I'm going to be finished so early. You guys be having lunch at 11.30. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. Uh, so stewardship is uh, established and, and granted in, every, uh, in the very opening chapters of Genesis. God calls mankind to take dominion over the earth. This was not self-serving or tyrannical dominion because the original couple was in close relationship with God. This executed God's will on his behalf towards the creation. They were to work it and keep it, Eden and of its uh, plant and animal inhabitants. They were imperfect. Uh, they were to reflect God's character to the creation. This is a great uh, definition of stewardship. It actually comes from a, um, an organization called the, the Christian Stewardship Society. I think. Um, so you go check them out. I think I'll put a link in the, in the bottom of the, the slides there. Um, you know, the, Greek, the Greek word for economics... Uh, is economia, or economic, economia, uh, meaning household management. Um, that's the word for economics. Uh, later on in the 18th century, uh, a guy called Adam Smith, he's irrelevant, but he uh, came up, he, he later, you know, by, that, by that time, um, this, this, this term economics, which was originally founded around the household management, well, it became so prevalent in society, he now called it the science of wealth. Uh, and this is where the term economist come, comes from, right? Because it is a scientist of wealth. The Greek word for steward is ekonomos, meaning household manager. Isn't that kind of interesting? How being a steward is, is like caring for the economy? Um, you know, if, for various areas of your life, you are owning them and or are you managing them on the behalf of God? Everything in your life is essentially given to you. You, know, you are, of course, made by God. You don't own your body. You don't own your wealth. You don't own your health. You don't own your mental state. All of those things are his, and it's your responsibility as a steward to take care of them. Uh, God's interests in your life are for good and they are for eternal uh, things and they are for prosperity. So acting in his behalf over your life produces good things 
eternal things and things of prosperity. Using the word of God to validate the decisions in your life or the methodologies you follow is a way that you can ensure you're being a steward and not a ruler over your life. So as we did before, where we had the, the table to evaluate our currents and our directions, there's also another table here to say, who's the steward in these areas of your life? Or who's the owner? Is it, is it you know, is God the owner uh, or is it you? you know, are you being a steward? If you are, then write down the word God. If you're not, you write down the word me. And uh, this is where, you know, going back to that, what I was saying at the beginning, you know, um, Sometimes you can say someone is lucky, you can say someone is blessed. You know, are you envious of that? Is it, you know, why do you have that thought? You know, it's, um, it, does it come from a place where you are saying, you know, as a steward of God that you, you're happy for that person? Uh, or is it coming from a place where you, you know, kind of are reflecting on, you know, like, where you're reflecting on, you know, someone, else, someone else's, uh, talents or someone else's positions and you kind of are wishing that, that you would be as fortuitous as that. That's a, that's a mindset of ownership, not a mindset of stewardship. So, yeah, as I was mentioning earlier with my, with my habits, the, this idea of um, putting Bible scripture to everything that I did validated that what I was doing was what God was directing me to do as well. Yeah? So I, I didn't have to go and take a step in a direction that wasn't a, a God-ordained step, that wasn't doing something that he didn't want me to do, which is really important if you were going to be the, a steward. And if you know that what he plans for you is going to be as, as a life of prosperity, then of course you want to do the things that he does. Uh, that makes a, a lot of sense as well. So God gives us specific instructions on how he wants various matters in our lives handled throughout the Bible. Um, and I wanted to talk specifically uh, around um, the tithing verse in, in, uh, in Malachi. So to understand, you know, we, we've used Malachi, you know, you know bring, the, uh, bring the tithe into the storehouse so that my house will be uh, filled. And uh, we use this Bible scripture a lot in tithe talks because it says, test me in this and uh, then, you know, see that I will not open the floodgates of heaven all over you. But it really helps to understand what is actually happening in Malachi, uh, the entire book, to really kind of figure out what's going on here. So in the book of Malachi, it's about a hundred years after the Babylonian exile. They've returned back into Israel and they've, you know, rebuilt their, their civilization. Um, but however, Israel has uh, their land back, but they've fallen out, uh, um, you know, fallen into injustice and poverty. Um, you know, they're doubtful of God's love and favor over their lives, and they actually despise God and they don't value Him. They bring Him sick and lame animals to to um, to what do you call them? Sacrifice. Um, you know, the men in Israel at the time are committing adultery, and they're doing that with foreign women, and they're adopting their gods. So they've kind of just like gone completely against what God wants them to do. They're definitely not being stewards of their, li- of their lives given to them by God. They're, you know, being their own man, right? Um, and the people are crying to God at the same time, and they're saying, you've neglected us. The relationship between God and the Israelites is completely broken. And they see themselves, you know, other people better off, and they're feeling like they were entitled to that. They were going, why, you know, why, are, you, why, why are these people getting you know, prospering and we're not? That's, you know, we're entitled to that because we're your people and you're not doing that for us. <laughs> um, and you know, God, God, says to them, God says to him through Malachi, you know, come back to me. And Israel is like, how do we do that? And this is where the tithe comes in. So like, the tithe is like the starting point for turning everything around for, for Israel. It's not just a test me in this. Like, that is only happening because the relationship's so broken. You know, like, it's not like a, um, you know, that you're already you know, a saved Christian and... and you know, you're, you're happy with God. You just had a worship session this morning. It was awesome. Um, 
you know, it, it's more like you want to, uh, you know, you, this is just like they, they need to start afresh and they need to figure out what's going on. So Malachi 3.10 says, bring the, whole, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Emphasizing the word bring there because it's an action. It's, being, it's a, uh, a master to his stewards telling him what to do. Go and bring something, obey me. That there may be food in my house, that's actually a statement for God, right? He's saying, like, I need funding. I need this, you know, the, the temple to be built up so that we can uh, you know, function again. Because equally with Israel in such a state where they've moved away from God, he doesn't have the, you know, the, the Levites essentially in the temple at the level that it needs to be to be able to administer the, the spiritual side uh, to, the, to the Israelites. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see that I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there is not enough for him to store it. So God is instructing his stewards what to do with his money to tithe to the church. So it's not like, you know, you can see how if you're in the place where, uh, where Israelite is and they're going, you know, it's, uh, these people are better off, we don't have anything, and, and you're not helping us, and it's all your fault, and, you know, and, and meanwhile they're going and doing you know, things like adultery and worshipping other foreign gods. They're like being their own men. When you're, when you're sort of in that position, you said, you know, told to give 10% of your income and to them, you go, well, that's mine, right? Like, why would I want to go and do that? You have not been helping us. I'm not going to give you, you know, another 10, you know, 10% of my income. And the mindset is completely broken there. And uh, they're forgetting this first fundamental truth that goes all the way back to creation that says that you need to be uh, a steward, that you need to obey in the very first instance. And it's from there that the relationship starts to, to rebuild. Notice how the power allows that God uses between tithing, which is currency, and the gushing of blessing illustrated by the opening of floodgates. There's not actually floodgates in heaven, right? Like, the, this is just a concept that he wanted to illustrate with us so we could understand that. After all, he gave us rivers in the beginning. So he, we could understand this concept. It's not like there are floodgates in heaven that are holding back blessing from everybody, Right? And then they just open them up when someone puts a coin in, right? You know, open the floodgates. But it's actually, uh, it, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, flood, floodgates in, in this world, they, they decrease the current through volume and control. So if you've ever gone to a dam or, a, you know, a floodgate of sorts, uh, usually what it does is it backs up the water behind it and it changes the landscape behind it. And it also reduces the flow out the front of it. And so there's a much smaller flow that goes on down. And what the Israelites were actually doing in Malachi is they had essentially built themselves a dam between them and God. And they had buried themselves up. So you know, opening the floodgates was essentially about knocking that back down. And that water supply coming back down from God and that blessing coming back down from God and, and, uh, and setting things right again. So the act of tithing addresses issues of ownership over our wealth. And it also funds the resourcing that feeds the current of the Spirit. So when I shifted into tithing, you know, I was uh, when I was growing up, you know, and the, the tithing um, offering plates would come around. We had these bags with wooden handles on either side, and it was like a velvet bag, you know, you know the ones, if you've been around long enough. And, um, yeah, it was always like, you know, mum would give me a 50-cent piece and be like, here you go, you can put this in there. And it's, oh, yeah, awesome. Had no concept of, you know, what is 50 cents doing <laughs> for, the, <laughs> for, the, uh, for the church. And uh, it certainly, you know, you have no concept of how much money is really required uh, and actually how much money comes out of your pay packet before tax, when you, uh, <laughs> when you, want to, you start tithing for real, it's like, oh, it's not 50 cents. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a big challenge. But you know what? When you obey and you start doing that, a bit like when I was <clears throat> every day, you know, speaking those habits over my life, that was producing a current, right, out of my, out of my mouth. And it had a strength on the frequency that I was saying it. And eventually, that current started to have an impact. A bit like if you put a, um, uh, take a rock from a cliff face, right, break it away, 
and it's all, it's all rough. And then you go throw it into the river and leave it for about, I don't know, a thousand years. Then it like completely rounds out, right? All of those edges that were on that, on that uh, rock is now completely smoothed away. And uh, it's the same thing that kind of happens with those habits, right? I start speaking those things and, you know, I stop drinking bad drinks and I start thinking, oh, yeah, I need to work out more regularly. And that plays away in my mind and then I eventually do something about it. And then, you know, like all of those things kind of uh, happen. So um, it's uh, the same thing kind of happened with, with the tithing was like I started this tithe and it created a, a, a current. And that current made me think twice about certain types of expenses that I wanted to uh, purchase. You know, well, should I actually go and do that right now or not? And every time that I revisit my finances, I always come away a bit more frugal <laughs> than, I'm, than I'm used to. Um, and so I probably need to do that a, more, a bit more frequently than I, than I do. But, um, but, you know, sure enough, like, I, when I started tithing, I thought I wasn't going to have the capacity for it. Like, I couldn't afford it type view. And, and now, like, I think, man, I could, you know, I, I, I have so much money that I'm not thinking about um, my finances in the way that I used to think about them. You know, you used to have, always have to check the bank to figure out if I was in overdraft or not or, you know, how to get out of I Don't do that anymore. You know, like I, uh, <clears throat> my, I think in, in really big numbers over our, over our budget, and we're really blessed to have, you know, a, a, great, a great income to deal with that. And so equally with more, like I'm trusted with more, I've, I've also expected to do the same thing. So I don't be like, well, you know, I started in at, at tithing at this rate, and so now I don't really have, you know, that's, that's my, my commitment now, and God blesses me, and that's great. I'm just going to keep tithing down there. Like, that doesn't work that way, right? It means you, you have to continue. And that kind of takes us over to the parable of the talents, um, where in you know, Matthew 25, uh, Jesus speaks about uh, these, this, this parable, you know, sort of describing a bit like what the, the kingdom of God is like. So uh, it's a big, long one to kind of get through. I was trying to figure out a way to cut this down just for the outline, and we didn't have to do it. But there's so much in this, and it's actually really good. So um, verse 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. So immediately here, um, the word servants is used a lot, but really the, these are stewards. Servants and stewards are somewhat interchangeable. Servants don't have a choice. Stewards kind of do, right? But often in, in the Bible, they were um, very similar. So for example, uh, Joseph, right? When, uh, you know, him, technical raincoat, um, he got uh, sold into slavery, was sold to a man called Potiphar in Egypt, and he became the steward of Potiphar's household. And doing so, he ran it immaculately, and you know, Potiphar really loved him, and um, so did his wife, apparently. Um, and so, you know, they, they um, he, you know, he did really well for himself. So he was a slave, but he was, you know, sort of living the high life, essentially, on, on someone else's dime. So, uh, verse 15, to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, and uh, each according to their ability, then he went away. So uh, each according to their ability. So he already knew from the get-go that these different three different slaves or different stewards had different abilities, and you know he already was expecting that he could give five to the to the, the first one. Let's um, let's call him Tom. And uh, you know Tom was going to do all right with that with that five talents. We don't know what t talents are, right? Like there the has no numerical understanding or corporate. let's call that million, right? He gave him five million dollars. And uh, he knew that Tom was going to do just fine with five million bucks. Then, um, then uh, Richard uh, got three, and he got three million. And again, Richard had had shown himself to be doing all right, so he got three million. And then Harry, <clears throat> he got uh, he got one million. And uh, he didn't know how well he was going to work out, right? So he was like, "Well, give this guy a try, and and see how he goes." And then he went away and. He goes away for a long time, which we'll get to a bit later on, but um, it's like a long time, right? So these guys have time to invest their money and do something with it. Uh, verse 16, uh, he who had five talents, so that was Tom, uh, went at once and traded them, and he made five talents more. So he made 
10 million. He's got 10 million now. Uh, and so he had the, and so he who had the uh, two talents made two talents more. I thought it was three, anyway. Two million, okay. So uh, that was Richard. And then, but he who had received the one talent went and dug in uh, a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. So after a long time, the servants came and settled the accounts with the master. And he who received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. Uh, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, and I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So here the master has given him money, and he didn't say it explicitly at the beginning, but there was an implicit expectation that he was going to increase that money or at least manage it for him. Kind of like managing a portfolio of cash or something like that. Um, and so he went and did it and he came back and he you know, was actually very um, you know, forthcoming with what he had done. You know, he, was, uh, he was really excited about telling his master that he had done good. Equally, the master was like, yeah, this is, this is exactly what I wanted. You can come in and enjoy you know, being around me because you were faithful. You did what I asked, right? Uh, and then the guy with two does exactly the same thing. And then the, the measure is the same, right? So you know, uh, Tom was like, I double my money. Richard's like, I double my money. And Master's like, awesome. Come, out, come into my house and party. Uh, and then Harry, right, who received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew to meet you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. Uh, so it turns out that in Mediterranean culture in that time, right, so long, long time ago, 2,000 years, uh, there was like the sort of view that the economy was a fixed size, that there wasn't any more to add to it, that it, that it didn't grow. That's everyone's perception. And so when you were to take from somebody else by trade or whatever it was, stealing or whatever, that meant that you took away from them and they didn't have anything else, right? So to increase was to decrease somebody else. So it was thought of as, as dishonorable to increase your wealth. It was about sort of more of a maybe communist view about trying to keep everything um, equal. And so um, what would often happen is that when, when uh, wealthier people, masters, wanted to increase their wealth, they would often sort of set that task upon their slaves because the slaves would go and do it and it wouldn't be, uh, they don't have any honor, so they, it wouldn't be sort of so bad if they went and kind of did that work for them. And of course, Jesus at this time is trying to confront this view, right? Because we know in this parable, he goes and scolds the, the, the uh, Harry, what's his name? And he scolds him because he didn't do anything with the money. But, um, you know, the, this, this view of it right now in, in that culture, the Mediterranean culture, was that that, that was the, the wrong thing to do. In fact, it, you'd almost see that the slave at the end, Harry, actually ends up doing the, the right thing of the time. He's doing the normal thing. So he says, you know, you, uh, you, know, you, you um, reaped where you didn't sow and gathered where you, where you scattered no seed. Both playing to the idea that he didn't do the work that, that, that the, uh, the slaves did, but also that you know, he's going to go and make a gain on someone else's hard work. Um, now, this here is all... Uh, I'll, fin I'll finish this before we go into that thought. So, um, but his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Uh, then you ought to have invested my money with bankers, and at my coming I would have received what was Owen with my investment. And of course, uh, he was away for a long time, right? And we know that from, from economy, uh, that banks offer interest rates. Interest rates are built from the Reserve Bank interest rates. Those, bank, those interest rates are based on what is the perceived inflation of our economy. So money, over time, decreases in value. The value of a dollar today is worth more than the value of a dollar tomorrow. So to have not done anything with his money, he meant that he didn't actually, he didn't, he didn't not just, he actually lost money, right? He, he didn't make money. Uh, he's gone on for a long time, and he actually lost more because that million with interest would have been worth more than it was today. 
So he's, he's kind of, you know, understandably angry, right? A million dollars is nothing to, to swim at. Um, so take the talent <clears throat> from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone uh, who has will have be will be given, and will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Does that not paint a picture of capitalism today in society? Right, like you've got a bunch of people who don't know how to take care of themselves. Simple. Um, aspects of life, the things that are biblical scripture, right? And they end up in poverty, and they even end up in more poverty. The rich get richer, and the poor get poorer. Why does that happen, right? We keep on thinking that it's a governmental problem to fix, but no, it's built into creation from the very beginning, that when you operate inside of God's stewardship, then he will bless you, and you will get out of poverty and into prosperity and if you do the opposite of those things, it sends you back the other way. So a slave does the work set by his master. His life is not his own. Remember Joseph, um, a master that then delegates responsibility of his household, household to his slaves according to their abilities. And this is why each slave got a different amount. The master went away for a long time. Uh, and as I discussed, the, uh, the inflation thing hit him hard. Uh, you know, Jesus is, is you know, preaching wealth uh, is created by God, and, and that it's not a fi- uh, and that it's not a finite resource. So again, the Mediterraneans had this view that wealth was a finite resource. There was only so much gold. There was only so much money in the economy. And Jesus is actually here trying to trying to tell everyone that it doesn't work that way. That it's infinite. Remember Malachi. He said, "I'll open the floodgates." There's just this blessing that pours out. And sure enough, if we look back to how wealthy the world was in the time of Jesus to how wealthy the world is today, there was a lot more wealth there. It didn't just come out of nowhere, right? Well, it did. So, <clears throat> so there's a, there is definitely more, more wealth there. And he was, at the time, trying to break this mindset that was inside of, uh, inside of the Mediterranean people. So burying the talent is wicked because prosperity is a part of God's design. To deny it would be wicked if Jesus were your Lord and Savior, uh, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that he wants his will over your life. He wants prosperity for you, he, and stewardship is a part of how God intends for you to acquire it. Uh, so that's for me, was the uh, moment where I understood why people got rich uh, without God, was that they weren't stewards, they were just operating in the principles all the same. But... The Bible, right, the stewardship is like the Christian's guide. It's the way that we, that's why stewardship is essentially set apart for us to, to follow this methodology that the rest of the world doesn't have to follow. So, yeah, you can go and find ways and secrets to wealth without getting uh, you know, insight from God. But, but as a Christian, what God wants is for your mind set to be around being a steward. And then that, that steward is, and that, that then keeps what you do in alignment with God's word and then that will always ensure that you end up in, in the prosperity that comes from the Bible. Uh, where were we? So, but if you are onerous, hold and protect rather than invest and grow, then, uh, then you'll miss the victory and you'll become the wicked and slothful, slothful servant who buries God's blessing in the ground. So you're remembering that these things are um, perpetual. So you know, uh, having, trying to, like, keep all of these areas of your life up and going, if you don't often um, tend to them, then they come away and, they, and you, you can sort of let them slip, you know. Um, uh, for a long time, for the last year, I've been on an interesting diet journey, trying to figure out how to, uh, how to eat according to what my body's going to let me do. And, uh, and sometimes I'll be, you know, traveling for work, and not have access to the food I need, or haven't gone shopping to the supermarket, and it's just not in the fridge, you know. And then you're hungry, and you end up making bad decisions because you, you know, you got bad options around, or something like that, you know. Um, and so, you know, you need to be vigilant in those things, and remember, well, you know, this is not my choice. I right? like this is, you know, my my body is a temple for God. I can't, um, you know, I can't be letting it get away on me. Right, that's not uh, it's not fair on on God who who you know, bestowed this on me. It's for me to take care. It's not for me to abuse. 
Um, so wrapping up early, uh, when, you're, when you're a steward of God and act on his behalf over the decisions in your life, blessings just come as a result. Sort of you, you stop thinking about them so much um, because they, you know, you're, you're just focused on keeping the currents going and they just you know, start, to, start to become bestowed upon you. Uh, and then you get entrusted with more, right? With blessing, blessing is more. Right, so with that blessing, you get more, and you are entrusted with that to do more, um, and this then becomes a perpetual cycle, right? So, you be a steward, create the current, get blessed. Be a steward with that blessing, create a current, get blessed, and it, it's accumulative, right? And this is where God's talking about in Malachi that the floodgates will open, right? Like this is an infinite deal that that can happen. And it's perpetual and it builds up. So this blessing but is actually a current and of its own. And it's like, it's an exponential one, right? Because it starts pouring out into you and then you have all of the currents in your life that then benefit from that and they get stronger as well. Um, so yeah, when, you, when you operate in interests that, God, uh, that, that don't reflect God's desires, it's like diverting that current flow. It's good at first because you still have the resources to work with. But without blessing uh, to replenish the current, uh, it will eventually stop and the blessing runs dry. You blame God and resent him for it, and the current turns the other direction, and the one who has not uh, even what he has will be taken away. It's kind of this amazing analogy where everything runs in one direction or the other, and you basically have the choice. You know, it's the idea of something being stagnant is not really true. If you, you know, disagree with that, just think about time and, and the impact that the, you know, the physical aspect of your life has on that. Uh, yeah, everything's going pretty well until you hit 21 and then you know, plateaus for a little bit and then you've got some challenges. So <coughs> I'm there too. I'm all right. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, you, you have to, um, everything's going in a, in a direction and you know, you've got to figure out how to uh, control that direction as a steward. You've got to figure out how to increase the strength of those things to the right levels. Uh, and then you've got to validate what your decisions are uh, based on, on the word of God. Um, I guess uh, in, in closing, uh, if you're thinking about like how do I, how do I sort of go from here, right? Um, so today, if you had a pen, you would have filled out some evaluations about yourself. This is a, a great map to start with. So you can look at the things that say, maybe I am you know, not being a steward in this area, or maybe I'm going in the wrong direction here. That's the stuff that you would, might, might want to focus on. Don't try all six at the same time. You know, if your map's looking not great at all, don't try all six. Just try, try ones that you think, one or two that, that need to you know, have the attention first. Um, because this is something that happens eventually over time. Think about that, you know, the hard rock and the smooth stone. Uh, it, it's like you need to apply the current over time to be able to make it change and change direction. It's like trying to steer a, a cruise ship, right? And um, it, it's going to take a long time for it to turn and then head back in the right direction, especially if it's been going in the wrong direction for some time. Um, so, uh, you know, just take those things and then... Uh, if you're thinking about, like, what, how do I know the things that God wants to do for me? You know, what are the things in this area that I should be doing as a steward of, uh, of God? Well, um, think, think through about, you know, what, you're, what you know. Don't, uh, you know, it can be quite hard to find the, the Bible verses. I've spent loads of time, you know, Googling and looking through things and searching Bible references and, and stuff like that to try and pick it up and, and understand what it is. Um, but, you know, those are all valuable options. But just try and write some statements down over your life, like some faith, uh, faith confessions. Write them down on a piece of paper. If you just pick one or two things and, uh, and then, you know, make that your list and, you know, put it up somewhere that's part of your routine every day. So this goes back to those habits, try and establish it as a part of it. So if you're really good at brushing your teeth every day, then maybe go put them by the toothbrush. And before you start brushing your teeth, you'll say those confessions, and then you'll brush your teeth, and then maybe you'll say them again or something. Or you know, if, if tooth, tooth brushing your teeth isn't a good thing, go and book an appointment with a dentist, 
and then, uh, and then look at a different habit. So, you know, everyone eats at some point. If that happens for you at the morning, you know, you got a coffee every morning, well, maybe put it by the coffee cup or something like that. Because um, if you can tie habit building to existing habits, it's actually easier to create them. Uh, if you forget to do them inside of your everyday routine, then uh, it can be very hard to establish them. Uh, and you're getting going is just the, absolutely the first step. Cool. So I'm going to close there.